tears And everything inside me quails with silent fears Because I try But I'm not what I should be And though I cry I could never seem to see And yet your voice in the silence of the deep rings through to me, saying, I believe. And if you never learn to fly or walk upon the sea, I'll still believe in all that you could be. And you may fail me. Do you trust me? Then my tears are wiped away In perfect confidence I say And all I want to do is give you cause to smile in your eyes a treasure store i've never seen before like a universe of love yet unexplored now i know i'm in your heart and neither death nor hell could tear us to Heart. But I might never learn to fly or walk upon the sea Yet you believe in all that I could be You never failed me, and heaven bright you bear your signet still I trust you, and always will I trust you and always will but you're not even satisfied at this you cannot rest you will not miss your plan is not fulfilled until I'm safe at home with you you spilled your blood to make me free you'll make me all I'm supposed to be never and forever when I grace and then I'll know I've learned to fly or walk upon the sea yet you believed in all that I could be you never failed me in heaven bright you bear your signet still I trust you and always will I trust you Thank you, Travis. I trust you and always will. How appropriate for the message that I will bring this morning. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, sometimes I feel the Apostle Paul was right when he talked about the foolishness of preaching. 
But the message this morning is from your word, and I just pray that you will use these frail lips to communicate them. And I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, uh, I need some help, and uh, I've got that. Um, Lily, can you help me? Oops, my box is falling apart. That's okay. It doesn't need just that part. See, that's, that's uh, there, Lily, you got something here for me. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. Okay, I think we're in under control here. I'm trying to find the right side here. Ta-da. It works. Okay. Um, uh, it's a little bit difficult to find a pearl, so I invest that in being my pearl for the morning. Now, uh, please... Do not think of soccer for the next few minutes. Okay. This is a pearl. You'll remember I talked about pearls last time, and I really can't get the pearl out of my mind. Um, now, I think that probably I should say, before we get into the pearl, that there's a lot of hurt going on, a deal of perplexity, because you see, last Sunday night at 11.30, the general hospital closed. Now, uh, little research shows that we have been in an intentional health ministry since 1899. Now, None of us were around in 1899. Two doctors, husband and wife, came here to start. Um, and uh, from that little tiny start, uh, we have had a health initiative or institutional initiative for almost 118 years. But 11.30, last Sunday night, the doors shut tightly. And there's a lot of hurt and perplexity. In fact, as I've talked to people, I notice that even members of our community don't exactly know what's happening. I can say honestly, neither do I. Uh, I'm sure God does. And uh, we're going to kind of talk about that today. Because, you see, we could sort of talk about why this is happening. You know, you've met the three charming sisters, haven't you? Uh, woulda, shoulda, and coulda. Well, they could have done this, they should have done this. They would have done this if, you know, but those sisters, as delicious and charming as they seem, and I must admit that I have indulged in talking about these things too, those three sisters won't solve a bit of hurt. Not one bit. In fact, um, the only thing that you and I can do is to establish greater trust in God. Actually, uh, the title of the sermon is the pearl and your future, but uh, it's interesting. Uh, I came up with a subtitle, okay? And here is the subtitle, 
and you're going to have to read between the lines because the pearl is here and we're going to revisit the pearl. There, here it is. You ready? Hold on. There are no miracles in your comfort zone. There are no miracles in your comfort zone. And as I was struggling, like everyone else in the valley, what in the world is happening? I mean, if it wasn't just the hospital closing, every single one of us struggles with something. The comfort zones have been broken. Uh, there is perplexity. The future seems unpredictable. That's one thing that we don't. We try to make our futures as predictable as possible. That's the reason why there's such a thing as comfort zone. Comfort zone is where you feel comfortable, where you, the things you feel comfortable thinking about, your habits. They, they even say there are comfort foods. Okay? So, what is it? Potatoes. Is that what I heard? As a com well, I, I suppose everybody has some kind of comfort food, but uh, the point is we're going to talk about the pearl. Now, you remember the last time that we were here, that I was here, a couple months ago, we talked about the pearl of great price. You remember the story? It was a graphic story. It was kind of a um, modern adaptation of Jesus' story, the pearl of great price, found in Matthew 13, by the way, 45 and 46. Um, and that, then the story went like this. A businessman was out. By the way, I'm not going to go through. I spent 35 minutes telling this story last week. That will not happen today. But just to review, um, the merchant who owned a jewelry store went down in Hong Kong. Hi. I think Hong Kong because I've lived there 26 years, so okay, I think Hong Kong. So, uh, And everybody's selling something and somebody else is buying something and it's crazy. Welcome to Hong Kong. So um, he goes and he sees this guy selling and he's got a little shop. He's dressed like a, well that's unusual, he's dressed like a carpenter. And he doesn't have much stuff. In fact, he only has a pearl. And uh, so you remember the story. Uh, he said, what do you want for your pearl? The pearl seller said, all you got. And so he's, he took his billfold out, emptied it. Now, I mean, it was a magnificent pearl. And you remember the story that step by step, the checkbook, and then uh, oh, the car, oh, you have a family. And it was absolutely crazy. The merchant, or the jewelry store owner, just kept giving and giving and giving, and every time he'd have foot, hoof, and mouth disease, you know, saying something that you didn't want to say, but it just kind of came out, and he said, uh oh, I said it again. Finally, you see, in the story you remember, you see the merchant with 
the pearl. And he's walking away. Remember the story? He's walking away. And here's the incredible twist. Oh, I want to. And at this point, the guy's heart. I mean, he's over his stooped shoulder. He is shaking his head. It's incredible that he has given all, absolutely all, for this pearl. And now, he has the nerve to ask one more thing. I would like to give you your car back because you'll have a hard time getting home without your car. But it's mine. But I want you to manage it. And one by one, everything, including his family and everything, comes back to him. He, he was incredulous. How, I mean, I bought the pearl for everything, and the pearl seller gave me everything back with only one condition, that I manage it like he would manage it. And he finally he said, okay, I, I can do that. Do you want your pearl back? Oh, no. No, no, no. The pearl is yours. And this is the incredible part of the story that it just blows my mind. That's the reason why I, like, I created the story in the first place. It just... The guy gave everything he had. And guess what? He got back everything that he gave. With only the simple condition, manage it like the pearl seller would manage. Now that, Travis, you sang the song about grace. You started, song started with grace. I, some people do listen, by the way. Uh, that is incredible grace. That God, I give everything to him and he gives everything back to me. What do you think about that? That is incredible. Now that's what happened last week. There are no miracles in your comfort zone. What I am suggesting this morning is that there will be disruptions. The point is Jesus is worth everything. In fact, in fact, most, I would say, most writers, go on Google and find out, type in, who is the pearl of great price? A surprising number will say Jesus is the pearl of great price. Now, welcome to Dr. Google. You'll get some crazy stuff there, but but Jesus is the pearl of great price. Ellen White speaks of Jesus as the pearl of great price. And the issue there is simply this. How much are you willing to give up? Now, even Jesus told the story of a widow who one day came to the temple and put in how many? Two mites. Now that's not very much. And as she walked away, now granted there were a lot of rich people with all sorts of rich gifts there, but as she walked away, with a smile on her face. Now she's the only one who was smiling. The rest of the people thought she was crazy. You see, she was smiling. Because she knew, and Jesus knew, a secret. She gave everything she had. How much is everything? It's all you have. It's all you have. Well, 
There is another way of looking at this. What do you know about merchants? Merchants, businessmen, merchants, is that a common? Sometimes my English fails me. Business people. Business people are always looking to make money. They are looking, now here's the point, Start to wrap your mind around it because it's pretty heavy. In fact, it's so heavy that my son told me last night. By the way, uh, if you this is a this is a commercial break. Uh, if you want an interesting story, come tonight at seven o'clock. Uh, my son has been there for 11 years in Guyana, 11 and a half years. Just came back on permanent return two days ago. Okay. Last, yesterday, he said, he called. He knows we, we can hardly wait to see him. And, and, and he, nothing digital works. So, he, see, finally he gets to a parent in law and he calls me. And, uh, and uh, I said, as I said, I'm preaching tomorrow. Well, you, you know, this I like uh, about my sons. You know, you talk about spiritual things and, and you never can stop. My wife, humble apologies, my wife. Uh, we just get going. And he's, this idea uh, came uh, from him uh, yesterday. And... A merchant will buy something va more valuable than he has. Right? How can I say that? There must be an easy way of saying that. People who are trying to invest in something are going to invest in something that is more valuable than anything they have. Now, if the pearl is Jesus, then the other side of the pearl is you and me. For you see, the great God of the universe Well, John 3.16 says it all. Repeat it with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now, here, if somebody is investing... And the heavenly merchantman, which is God, is looking for an investment, something that God doesn't have. Can you... I'm trying to wrap my mind around this. How can I say this? You and I are so valuable that he emptied heaven and sacrificed himself in his son. Amen. Why? To get something that he didn't have. Why? Was somebody so smart, so powerful, so wise, invest in garbage from the garbage dump of the universe. But he did. He did. And Ellen White, in her typically graphic words, uh, put it, you, you've got to read the whole paragraph. Uh, I just don't have the time here. 
the Lord God of heaven collected all the riches of the universe. How much of the riches of the universe? All. all. How much? Every bit of it. All. He collected all the riches of the universe and laid them down in order to purchase the pearl of lost humanity. That's me. That's you. God was willing to give it all. I believe that this concept alone if you spend a thoughtful hour. Do you hear, ever hear a quotation, something like that? Spend a thoughtful what? Hour. How often? Every day. In contemplation, what? Of the life of Christ. Especially the closing scenes. If you realize that God was in his son reconciling the world, solving the problem of this world, it seems to me to do it, I am valuable. Well, uh, about the first time when Mrs. Ash said to me, I love you. Man, I, the hormones went crazy and everything went crazy. But practically speaking, you know what? When we got back to, to Walla Walla, this was 100 years ago, but uh, <laughs> when we got back to Walla Walla, the first thing I was thinking about is, can I wash her car? Now, that's practical. She didn't say, would you wash my car? I offered and said, look how love works. It's practical. It takes initiative. Can I help you with the dishes? Oh, well, I'm glad you offered it. You see, love takes the initiative, and when we realize the absolute value that heaven places on us, we are the pearl. If, if we could just grasp that in our poor minds, we would be changed. There would be a motivating power within us that wouldn't stop. My next point, you know, it does help to look at my notes occasionally. My next point, if God sees you and me as the pearl of great price and he was willing to give such an expensive gift, his only begotten son, his unique son, a co-ruler of the universe, if they were willing to do that, then, listen carefully, wouldn't you think that he would still be interested in taking care of me? I mean, he's no absent watchmaker that gets the thing ticking and goes away. He loves us so much that he gave his only begotten son. He has purchased the right. Hold on now. Because it gets heavy at this point. The creator of the universe, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, have, in a covenant decision, decided, and Jesus carried it out, they have, on the cross, purchased the right to invade our 
lives with disruption. Let me think about that. They have purchased the right. So, here is the point. There are no miracles in your comfort zone. And I, I keep looking at this clock. I will suggest right now that if something has disturbed your comfort zone, whether it be you've lost your job, your friends have lost your, their job, whether there's a death in the family, every time something happens that disrupts your life, It's God at work. John 5, 17. Never forget it. The clearest statement in all the Bible that God is at work. And it couldn't get, it couldn't get simpler than John 5, 17. And Jesus answered them, My Father is working until now. I should have counted how many words that was. It wasn't very many. From eternity he has been working for us. And I am working. God is at work when our lives are disrupted. And that happens for some of us every day. Uh, God has purchased the right to invade our lives. Because, why? We are the pearl of great price. My, I'm always asking myself, well, why? Why am I the pearl of great price? I don't feel very priceless a lot of the time. But the reason is, <clears throat> for eternity, you and I will be the prime example of the love of God. Amen. Now, of course, they're, they're the marks of the crucifixion are in the hands of Jesus. That doesn't change. He loves us for eternity. But folks, the reason why he loves us is because he wants something that he doesn't have. Prime evidence that he is a God of love. He doesn't have that now, but you and I will be that prime evidence. Now, isn't that grace? That is unmerited favor to take to, to go to the garbage dump of the universe and look for you and me, every one of us. You know, uh, Hong Kong is not too far away from uh, uh, the Philippines. And uh, uh, down in the Philippines, they have a garbage dump, and they have a whole village that lives in the garbage dump. These are people that live in the garbage dump. I don't know... Uh, and, and I guess the garbage dump becomes their comfort zone. Now that seems strange, but I got, I got news for you that, that sometimes in bad situations, we stay there so long that it becomes our new comfort zone. Well, you just think of Moses in the wilderness. You know, uh, you know he... He went, not in the wilderness, but went to Midian for 40 years. I mean, he had a cushy life until he got uh, to the age of 40. Then from 40 to 80, he was in the herding sheep. And that became his new comfort zone. Until God said, I have 
or I will purchase the right for you. So I'm going to invade your comfort zone. At the age of 80, go back to Egypt. In the garbage dump, the new comfort zone. Folks, wherever you are, God has purchased the right to invade our comfort zones. Now, I am. Uh, In trying to get this pearl this morning, I had to call out to the farm and said, do you have a white soccer ball? And they said, yeah, I think so. So they went out and looked for it. And then uh, they said, Pops, it's dirty. Clean it up with Comet. Okay, I brought this because, uh, and this is my apology to, to you guys. I didn't trust that you'd get it clean. And so I thought, well, at the church, I would just, I would just get something to clean it up a bit. Well, they did a pretty good job, so I didn't have to do that. Now, here's the point, folks. When, when God disturbs our comfort zone and you're out of a job, or there's been a death in the family, or you're uh, sick, or a thousand other things, all, he is, all God is trying to do is to clean us up. That's all. That's all. Now, Ellen White, uh, in, I believe it's this quotation here, she says, he, uh, he comes down looking for pearls, and I just love her terminology, encrusted with selfishness. Oh my. Could I be selfish? Oh my, yes, I am selfish. I need grace. Selfish, encrusted, clean the pearl. God is in the great cleaning business. Okay, now, if this is true, then what can we do? If we discover that God has messed up our comfort zone, things went belly up. Well, that's maybe not a nice word. Uh, upside down. Um, and our lives are not efficient. We are unhappy. What do we do? Here's what we do. We, well, this is what I did this week. I started in Genesis to Revelation, and I made two discoveries. First of all, that God was in control. That's what the whole Bible's about. God is in control. From Genesis to Revelation, God is in control. Now, if God is in control, then he's also in control of my life. We just figured that out. Okay, and the next thing I discovered is that from Genesis to Revelation, God specializes in invading and disrupting people's lives. Because he loves you and he loves me. Isn't that incredible? And so as I started thinking, I, I probably still have the piece of scratch paper. I just started with Genesis, and I started writing down, okay, uh, Abraham, Moses, I'm skipping a lot, and you go down through the prophets, uh, Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, you know, Habakkuk, oh, that was an interesting story. And 
step by step, we see that God, not only is God in control, but he also is capable of invading our lives and disrupting us because he's in the business of cleaning us up. Cleaning us up. Do you guys know what this is? I don't. When I was a kid, it was Ajax. Do they still have Ajax? I don't know. But anyway, Comet works. Clean us up. That's what God's in. So, these people I looked at, um, maybe I should uh, just say it this way. Daniel. Here's a prime example. Daniel. Here he is. Here is a young man who is the the nobility of his nation. He's a young man, and home is fine. There are no miracles uh, in your what? Remember? There are no miracles in your comfort zone. So God said, we can solve that. Uh, The Babylonians came. He was carried off. You know, just going across the desert to Babylon is enough to break your spirit. He gets to Babylon. How is he going to respond? With hate? Revenge? Not Daniel. Here's what he did. In quick succession, uh, he prayed. Daniel 2, he was about to get killed because nobody could answer what that big metal image was all about. Nebuchadnezzar's image. And he said, let's pray. Okay? He and his friends prayed. Okay, and then when Daniel's friends got stuck there and they had to kneel down to an image that Nebuchadnezzar made, and guess what? They they got thrown into a fiery furnace. Wow. Not only only that, you can believe that they were... Uh, praying there. And then Daniel, as his, well, let's look at that. Uh, Daniel 610, uh, and in his upper room, with his windows open toward Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as was his custom since what? Early days. Folks, get in the habit of praying. By the way, years ago I preached a sermon uh, on uh, living on the edge. Can I, can I make, you can tell me whether I'm crazy or not, Most preachers are, somewhat. Okay. Uh, I believe that unless you live on the edge, you know what that means? If you live risking yourself for God, you will experience miracles. Because in the comfort zone, There are no miracles. Live on the edge. And those who live on the edge, those who are risking for God, will pray better. They will. Because you have a reason to pray. But that's not all. He studied the Bible. Wait! So early, and you study the Bible, there's actually a text in Daniel that says, 
I studied the books and the book of what? Jeremiah. Now, who was Jeremiah? Here's Daniel. He's totally out of his comfort zone. And what is he doing? He is studying the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah, Daniel, Ezekiel, all three contemporaries. I mean, that just that idea there is incredible. He studied God's word. And my, I see my time is running out. I want to share one more thing. Please, do yourself a favor and read through the book of Daniel quick. Wait, 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 wait. Listen carefully. I said quick. Don't get stuck with the prophecies. For the moment, not interested. Just look for Daniel and his friends. You will discover something that there is power in people grouping together. Now Jesus said, where there are two or three gathered in my name, there I will be in the midst of them. Remember that? Okay. But incredibly, when the world crashes, if you have a group, and you are praying together. Wow. Now, I don't know exactly how many groups are in this church, but one of the most heartening things that my wife and I experienced is when we came here, we discovered that the, this church had groups of Adventists Brothers and sisters, here and there and everywhere. Well, I hope there are. I am in two of them. Praying. And the preacher didn't ask us to do it. Because we understand. Well, I don't know whether they do, but I do. I understand that when there are a few people gathered together in God's name, you will be able to cope with the disruptions of your life because we are supporting each other. Now, there's much more that could be said, but here's the point. Folks, God has the right to invade our lives, and if we will pray, study his word, and get together. with other believers. And then, hang on to your seatbelts, even invite a non-Christian to join you. Then you will have power to cope when your comfort zones are breaking up. Let us pray. Father in heaven, give us grace and power to understand that you are with us all the time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.